Hello, beautiful friends. Thank you so much for joining me back on my channel. It's so nice to have you back. I hope you are having the best week of all time and that this video just finds you super duper well. If you are new here and you have never seen this face before, then hi, my name's Liz. And if you're into things like true crime and unsolved mysteries, then you should probably just hit subscribe and we can be best friends forever. You know, if you're in into that. But just so you know, we're best friends now. As usual, of course, it's not just me here. We have the real star of the show, Lily Girl, here to give us top-notch emotional support and just a generous helping of visual and audio disturbances. Editing Liz, let's switch to Lily Cam. Hey, Lily Girl. You ready for the video? You going to keep us company? I am so excited about today's case, the Summerton Man case, or as it's also known, the Taman Should case. As some of you watching will probably be aware, it is one of Australia's biggest unsolved mysteries of all time. I feel like Kanye West every time I say of all time. Of all time! If you have not heard of this case, you are in for a real treat. There is something in here for everyone. There's, of course, tons of mystery and intrigue. There's a heartwarming whirlwind romance. And without giving too much away, there is potential international espionage activity. It's pretty wild. Now, this is a case that's 70 odd years old, but it popped up on my radar recently because there's a lot of current day updates happening right now. And if you are up to date on the case, you know what the updates are and they're very exciting. My plan was originally to just do one video on the case, but once I started researching, I was just well and truly dragged in and I thought I knew the case pretty well, but there was just so much I learned and I wanted to share with you guys. So I changed my mind. We are going to do a deep dive on the Summerton Man case and I'm breaking it into two parts. So there is going to be a lot of information in these videos. And if at any point you are like Liz, please, for the love of God, move on, then you can go down to the description where I have included timestamps so you can zip around any way you like and just skip my rambling. <laughs> and with all of that said, let's get on with the case. So this case begins in late 1948 in an area called Glenelg, which is a suburb of the city of Adelaide in South Australia. Now, 1948 was 72 years ago. And seeing as I doubt I have a lot of 72-year-old Australians watching going, yeah, I know exactly what Australia was like in 1948. We are going to set the scene a little. Firstly, World War II had ended just about three years prior and there were still shortages on goods. The rations that had been in place on things like sugar, meat and clothing had just slowly been getting lifted over the last couple of years. So the relief of the war being over was still very real and a lot of people were just getting into the rhythm of post-war life. When it came to entertainment, the options were a lot more limited than today. Televisions wouldn't hit Australia's shores for a good few years yet, so people had to be a lot more creative at keeping themselves occupied during their free time. Playing musical instruments was more popular, along with listening to music on the radio, and people got most of their news from the newspapers. A lot more time was spent on pursuing crafts and hobbies, and kids were a lot more actively encouraged to go run them up and find adventures outside. One favourite pastime that had been very popular during the war as a way to escape reality, if you will, was going to see a film at the theatre, and this popularity continued. In 1948, a couple of the biggest films had been Key Largo, starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, and a really dark ballet film called The Red Shoes, which is all about a ballerina whose red shoes force her to dance until she dies. Fashion, of course, was very different in the 40s. For women, the bikini had made its controversial debut and dresses were a little bit shorter thanks to strict rationing on fabric during the war. Dresses now sat at about knee length as opposed to the 30s when they had sat at about calf length. 
For men, the go-to was usually a sharp tailored suit and a nice hat, or if they were feeling a little bit more casual, then Hawaiian shirts and knit sport shirts were all the rage. Now, although, like I said, people were starting to get into post-war life, there was another war that was just beginning to reach its peak, the Cold War, because apparently the world just couldn't catch a break. So in 1948, people were still definitely on their toes. They were worried about the threat of invasion. And thanks to the endless propaganda pumped out to the public at the time, a lot of them were very paranoid about the spread of communism. So now that we've got a general idea of what everyone was up to in the 40s in Australia, let's zoom in and have a look at what occurred on the evening of Tuesday, the 30th of November, 1948 in Glenelg. At about 7 p.m. that night, a local jeweler by the name of John Bain Lyons and his wife, Helen, went for their regular nightly stroll along the shore at Somerton Beach. As the couple walked about 20 yards ahead, they saw a man slumped against the seawall near some stairs. And this was quite an open area, not hidden or secluded at all, just opposite a crippled children's hospital because in the 40s that was apparently a totally acceptable name for a hospital. The man was just laying there casually with his legs stretched out in front of him crossed at the ankles and he appeared to be very smartly dressed for the beach in a nicely tailored suit but he also appeared to be a little bit drunk. Helen pointed out the odd way the man was slumped with just his head and neck leaning against the seawall and John (laughs) made fun of her for being just observant and was like, yeah, you're right. I'm going to report this to the police later. As they continued walking closer, the man raised his right arm, looking like he was maybe going to light a cigarette, but then just let it fall limply to the sand, apparently too drunk to even do that. So the lions passed the man by, leaving him to his own devices and didn't think much of what they had seen. Half an hour later, another couple, Gordon Straps and Olive Neal, visited the beach. And for about half an hour, they sat on a bench just above the seawall, and they too noticed this man laying just below where they were sitting. They couldn't see his face, but they were able to see that immaculate suit he was wearing and this cloud of mosquitoes that just swarmed around him. But the man made no effort to swat away the mosquitoes. In fact, Gordon and Olive didn't see the man move the entire half hour they were sat there. His arm just stayed splayed out on the sand beside him. The mosquitoes were continuing to just swarm around him. In fact, Gordon turned to Olive and said that the man must be dead to the world to not notice them. Gordon and Olive were curious about the man, but not suspicious. So they assumed the same as the lions, that the man was drunk and just sleeping off the alcohol. So they too just minded their own business and left him to it. The next morning, the 1st of December at about 6am, John Lyons returned to the beach for a refreshing morning swim. And just in case you're watching this on the other side of the world and are like, why are all these crazy people at the beach in the dead of winter? The 1st of December is actually the first day of summer in Australia. So Don't worry, it was very warm and they were all fine. As he moved closer, John realized with growing horror what the jockeys were looking at. It was the drunk. The man he and his wife had seen was still there in the exact same position he had been in the night before. To confirm their suspicions, one of the jockeys reached out and touched the man's leg and found it was cold and stiff. So the man was definitely dead and had probably been so for a decent while. So John raced off to go and find a phone to call the police who arrived on the scene at about 6.45 a.m. Now, while this had obviously been a horrifying discovery for John and the two jockeys, it was nothing that would shake up police. Their initial assumption was that this man, while severely intoxicated, had stumbled onto the beach, laid down to sleep off his drunken stupor, and then died in his sleep for whatever reason. There were no signs of foul play, like disturbed sand around the body as though there had been a scuffle. The man's suit, like I said, was immaculate. There was no tearing or missed buttons like you would expect if he had been in a struggle. He had a half-smoked cigarette resting on his collar as though it had fallen out while he was falling asleep. So 
To police, this was a pretty open shut case. It was tragic, yes, but nothing they hadn't seen before. The man's body was taken in a police ambulance to Royal Adelaide Hospital, where he was officially pronounced dead at 9:40 a.m. by Dr. John Barclay Bennett. Just in the ambulance out side of the hospital. They didn't even bother to bring him inside. Then it determined that at some point no earlier than 2am, the man's heart had stopped beating and that this was the immediate cause of death. But a rather underreported note on this 2am time of death is that the way Bennett determined this was purely by rigor mortis, and this is now considered a highly inaccurate method. To determine time of death these days, medical examiners take into account multiple different indications, including rigor mortis, of course, but also the temperature of the body, lividity, the amount of cloudiness in the cornea, and several other pointers. And they use all all of this information together to determine the time of death. So considering that Bennett only went off rigor mortis and didn't take any of these other factors into account, which was common practice in the 40s, I'm not bagging on Bennett, but experts today say that there is every chance that the man died before 2 a.m. So after the declaration of death, the body is taken to the city mortuary where the next morning at 7.30 a.m. a postmortem is carried out. And it was at this point as the man's clothes and the contents of his pockets were being examined that police slowly realized that this case might not be as straightforward as they had initially thought. From here on in, in this case, there are a lot of fine details that I, of course, want to be accurate with. So please ignore me if I'm being rude and reading my notes. The man's clothing was made up of a sharp looking brown and gray double-breasted jacket, a nice pair of brown trousers, a white shirt and singlet, a red, white, and blue tie, and a very fashionable brown knitted pullover. But all of the maker's name labels and the tags had been carefully cut out of the clothes. Now, like I said, this was the peak of the Cold War. Literally just a couple of months before this, a Soviet embassy spy ring had been discovered in Canberra, the capital of Australia. So with this still very much so in the forefront of everyone's minds, once this detail about the tags being carefully cut out of this man's clothes was revealed, there was pretty much immediate rampant speculation that he was a spy, specifically a Russian spy. While I was researching, I spoke to my husband about the case and he stopped me here and was like, I'm sorry, why does someone cutting the tags out of their clothes mean they're a spy? So just in case some of you in the audience are a bit confused as well, cutting tags out of clothes is or was quite a common practice amongst spies and agents. You can discover a lot about someone from their clothes, especially back then when the market wasn't dominated by huge chains and individually owned and branded stores were more prominent. Back then, a spy could quite easily be traced back to their home country and city just by the tags in their clothes. So as a result, they quite often cut them out. Back to the man found on the beach, he wasn't wearing a hat, which was very unusual for the 40s and equally as unusual, he wasn't carrying a wallet or any cash or identification. His shoes were pretty much brand new and polished to a quote unquote mirror shine. In fact, they were so shiny that detectives figured they had to have been polished either the morning before the body was found or later. And there was no way that the man had walked around the beach for very long before he ended up where he was found, or the shoes would have shown a lot more wear. The few possessions the man had in his pockets were two combs, one being plastic and the other being a US manufactured aluminium comb, a handkerchief, a half empty packet of juicy fruit chewing gum, a quarter full box of Byron and May matches, an army club cigarette pack, which actually had seven conceited cigarettes in it, which was a more expensive brand. He also had a unused second class train ticket from Adelaide to Henley Beach for 10.45am the morning before he had been found. 
and a bus ticket from Adelaide to St. Leonard's, which is what Glenelg was called in the time and was in the general direction of Somerton Beach. Then, of course, there was the body. The man was estimated to be between 40 and 45 years old with blue-gray eyes and brown gingery hair that was graying at the temples. He had a slightly receding hairline and his hair was pushed straight back from the hairline with no part, which was a very popular style in America at the time. He was 5'11 and in tip top shape. He had broad shoulders, a narrow waist, quite a muscular athletic build. He was obviously a man of considerable strength, but his hands, which were said to be quite large, showed no signs of manual labor. Dr. John Dwyer, who carried out the autopsy, would say later, and I quote, the general impression I gained was that he was a man whose bearing you would take notice of by reason of his general appearance, unquote. And the man did appear to be in the habit of looking after his appearance as well. When he was found, he didn't have a hair out of place, but I mean, the guy did have two combs on him. So he was also clean shaven. His fingernails were clean and nicely trimmed, probably not more than a couple of days before he had died. Uh, on his hands, Dwyer did notice a couple of abrasions in the hollows of the knuckles. So not here as though he had punched something more here in between the knuckles. There were also nicotine stains on his fingers signaling that the man was a regular smoker. He was also missing a large portion of his back teeth. Like if you were talking to him, you probably wouldn't have noticed, but if he were to smile or laugh, you definitely would have seen he was missing those teeth. But he wasn't wearing a dental plate and he didn't appear to be in the habit of wearing one either, which was surprising because if he was missing a lot of his back teeth, How did he chew his food? His calf muscles and his feet were very interesting. He had large defined calf muscles that sat up higher than you would expect from say a cyclist or a runner, more like that of a dancer. And his toes were very slightly wedge shaped as though he was in the habit of wearing high heels or more likely pointed shoes, which he would if he was say a ballet dancer. Now, for the longest time, whenever I would read about this case and I read the phrase wedge-shaped toes, I would conjure up this image of this misshapen foot with like a bunion or something. And it wasn't until recently I found out that this wasn't the case at all. It turns out the man's feet were said to be beautifully shaped, narrow with no deformities, no gaps between the toes, just that the big toe lent in slightly towards the rest of the toes. So for those of you out there that are familiar with the case and have thought the same as I had, you're welcome. That's what they actually meant by wedge-shaped toes. The man's body bore no bruising or wounds or any other signs of violence and had very little identifying marks or scars. The only scars he had were three small scars inside his left wrist, a curved scar inside his left elbow, and one final scar on his upper left forearm. The man's heart was normal sized and just as healthy as you would expect from someone in his physical condition, but his spleen, on the other hand, was was swollen to three times regular size. Now, this could have been caused by a underlying health condition, say a viral or bacterial infection or lupus or even cancer, but no other evidence of these conditions were found anywhere in the body. But in his stomach, mixed in with the remains of a pasty that he had eaten three to four hours before he died, was a large amount of blood. Small blood vessels in his brain that are not normally visible were easily seen because they were so congested. And there was also a great deal of congestion in his small intestine and his kidneys. His liver was also distended with a large amount of blood in its vessels and the lobules of the liver were quote unquote destroyed. All of this suggested that the man had in actuality been poisoned and suddenly his behavior on the beach that night, like him raising his right arm and then just letting it limply drop to the sand, didn't sound so much like drunkenness as it did him slowly dying from whatever poison was in his system. But when Dwyer sends off samples of the man's blood, urine, liver and stomach contents to be tested, All of the tests come back negative and they had tested for a lot of different poisons, including cyanide, alkaloids, barbiturates, and carbolic acid. 
Dwyer actually had the chemist test the specimens again because he was so astounded at the results, but the results come back exactly the same, negative for even the smallest trace of poison. The man's pupils were smaller than normal, which could have indicated the presence of poison or drugs in his system, but it also could have indicated a multitude of other things. And while there was a small amount of dried saliva on the right-hand side of his mouth, there was a complete lack of vomit or sign of convulsions, which would have been expected if the man had been poisoned. So essentially they had a man in particularly good health with a very healthy heart that had just stopped beating for reasons they couldn't determine. And this man's body showed symptoms of poisoning, but zero poison was found in his system. It was a real conundrum. In the end, Dwyer's finding was that the man had died of unnatural circumstances. He just couldn't for the life of him determine what those circumstances were, so couldn't with any confidence say what the cause of death had been. Meanwhile, the story of the unknown man found dead at Summerton Beach had hit the newspapers, and he quickly became known as the Summerton Man after where he had been found. Police were still patiently waiting for someone to come forward and identify the man when a newspaper called The Advertiser ran an article claiming that the Summerton man's name was E.C. Johnson. But the following day, E.C. Johnson walked into a police station to prove that this definitely was not the case and he definitely was still alive and not the man found dead on the beach. The Summerton man's body was fingerprinted and photographed and these were sent out along with dental records to police throughout Australia but this produced zero matches. So this South Australian police cast out a wider net and sent these photos and records to New Zealand, British and American police, but this again produced no matches and brought them no closer to discovering the Summerton man's identity. People flooded the mortuary in response to police calls to the public to help identify the man. There were relatives of missing persons. There were people that had just seen the photos of the man in the paper and thought they might recognize him. And there ended up being eight different possible identifications, but all of these were ruled out one by one. Detectives were beyond frustrated with their lack of progress in the investigation now. Hello. I think we're having a lily break. <laughs> As I was saying... <laughs> As I was saying, the detectives were frustrated with their lack of progress in the case, so they decided to switch up their game. They figured, okay, there's no way that what this man had on him when he died was all he had in the world. He probably travelled to Adelaide from somewhere else, so let's start looking for where he might have left his other possessions or luggage. So in January 1949, they began a big search of all of the lost property offices, the hotel hotels, the dry cleaners and train stations in the Adelaide area. And it was a couple of days into this search on the 14th of January that they came across a suitcase. And this suitcase had sat unclaimed in the cloakroom of Adelaide train station since the 30th of November, the day before the man's body had been found. Detectives didn't get their hopes up yet, of course. The station was frequented by hundreds and hundreds of people every day. They had unclaimed items all the time. This could have been anyone's suitcase. And whoever deposited it would have received a luggage tag and no such tag had been found in the man's pockets. The suitcase was brown it was of very nice quality and was remarkably new. The luggage tag that would have been on the side had been ripped off. There was just sticky residue there now. So there was no way to tell where the suitcase owner had traveled to Adelaide from. When questioned, the staff at the cloakroom couldn't remember any details about the person that had deposited it, but this wasn't surprising considering how busy the train station was. Inside the case were some clothes, including a red checked dress dressing gown, some pyjamas and slippers, a couple of shirts, two ties, two jackets, a scarf, a pair of trousers that had been dry cleaned recently, and a couple of singlets and underwear. There were six handkerchiefs and some toiletries, including soap and a soap dish, a razor and shaving brush, toothbrush and toothpaste, and also a couple of coat hangers and some envelopes and some stamps. So 
pretty regular luggage items so far. But again, intriguingly, almost all of the tags had been removed from the clothing. There were a couple of tags left though, on a singlet, a tie, and a laundry bag. And these tags had a name on them, T. Keen. But in some instances, it was spelt key with an E on the end, and in others, the E on the end was missing. But this E could have just been washed or worn off. As they went through the suitcase, detectives quickly became certain that it had in fact belonged to their man. The clothes were the same size as the Summerton man's, and the handkerchief and the underwear were the same as what had been found on the body. And just to seal the deal, they found a thread card of Barber brand orange wax thread inside the suitcase. This was a really unusual type of thread that was produced in the US and not available for purchase in Australia. And this unique thread was a match for the thread that had been used to mend the lining in one of the pockets of the Summerton man's trousers that he had been wearing. So it was pretty clear to police they had the right case. The only money the Summerton man seemed to have at all, considering he had no cash on him when he was found, was six pence that was found in a pocket of the trousers in the suitcase. There was a noted lack of socks in the suitcase, which a lot of people have thought is very odd over the years, but it can easily be explained away by him either just forgetting to pack socks or by the post-war shortages that I mentioned at the start of the video. Also in the suitcase were two pairs of scissors, one of which was broken, an electrician screwdriver, an ordinary table knife that had been shortened and sharpened down, as well as six pencils, a square of zinc, and a brush that was usually used for stenciling. And these items seemed to make up a kit that would quite often be used by a third officer on a merchant ship for stenciling cargo. So this was a pretty big clue as to the occupation of the Summerton man, but unfortunately it was a clue that never really led detectives anywhere. One of the jackets in the suitcase was determined to, without a doubt, have been produced in America because of a feather stitch used in its production that other sewing machines in other countries, including Australia, didn't have the capabilities to replicate. The jacket also definitely had not been imported to Australia. So the only way the Summerton man could have gotten his hands on this jacket would be to be in America himself and purchase it then, or to have purchased it off someone else who had purchased it in the States. But while the jacket had been mass produced, it had also been made to measure before it was completed. So it's a pretty safe assumption that the Summerton man purchased it himself in the US. So working on this assumption, detectives went through shipping and immigration records from across the entire country. But again, this turned up zero leads. They also, of course, investigated the name T. Keen, but it didn't match any missing person in any English speaking countries. So they felt like it might have been a red herring. I mean, why go to all the effort of removing tons of tags from your clothes if you're just going to leave other tags that have your name written on them? Detectives came to the conclusion that it was less likely that these tags had been just overlooked or forgotten, and more likely that they had been intentionally left there in a deliberate attempt to mislead investigators by someone who knew that the Summerton man's name was not T. Keen. So although some of the contents of the suitcase had been pretty interesting and should have finally helped investigators uncover the identity of their man, it was kind of the opposite. It just added more mystery and confusion and the discovery of the case didn't really advance the investigation in any way. The police were, however, able to put together what they believed was a fair guess as to the man's movements on the 30th of November, the day before his body was discovered. So they speculated that the man had arrived in Adelaide by train sometime between 8.30 a.m. and 10.54 a.m. and that he had then checked in his suitcase at the cloakroom at some point between 11 a.m. and 12 noon. He then purchased a train ticket to Henley Beach, but for whatever reason didn't use it. He instead left the train station at some point after 11.15 a.m., crossed the street and caught a bus and he bought a seven pence bus ticket to St. Leonard's, which is in the general direction of Summerton Beach. Interestingly, the bus he got on departed every 30 minutes and if he had waited for the next one, it would have taken him closer to where he was found. The one he did catch meant an extra 20 minute walk. So he may have been unfamiliar with the area and the bus routes 
or he may have had business to attend to in the area he was dropped off in. And at some point he ate a pasty, but between this point and when the couple saw him laying on the beach, the police could only speculate that he couldn't have been walking around Glenelg that whole time or his shoes, his very shiny shoes, would have shown a lot more wear. Skip forward to June 1949 and police are acutely aware that the man's body is slowly decomposing in the city morgue, having been laying there unclaimed for six long months now. The body had already been embalmed with formaldehyde so that they could keep it on display, but one of the man's toes was starting to look seriously not great. Seeing no end to this mystery in sight, the South Australian police made an unusual decision to commission a man named Paul Lawson to make a plaster cast of the man's head and upper torso. They made this decision, of course, because they knew they were going to have to bury this man very soon. And if they had any hope of ever discovering his identity, the post-autopsy photos were just not going to cut it. A couple of days before the Summerton man was buried, his body was examined one final time, this time by Sir John Cleland, who was a very respected and accomplished professor in pathology and b- bacteriology. Bacteriology. Nailed it. Although retired, Cleland had performed 7,000 odd autopsies during his career, so Dwyer had reached out for him for help because he still could not figure out how the Summerton man had died. So Cleland examines the body, but he's pretty much just as equally stumped as Dwyer. He agrees that there's no way the man died of natural circumstances. He rules out things like a diabetic coma, also vagal inhibition, which happens when pressure in the neck causes the compression of the vagus nerve, which can cause the major organs of the body to just stop functioning, in turn causing sudden death. This was something that had been suspected at one point because of the awkward way the man had been laying with just his head and neck supported by the seawall. Just like Dwyer, Cleland also leaned towards the idea that the man had been poisoned, so he was just as equally surprised by the negative test results, also by the lack of vomit and convulsions. It was a real pickle. While he was there, Cleland also examined the man's clothing and he found a couple of things that had been overlooked. Firstly, a couple of blades of barley grass, one stuck in one of the trouser legs and the other in one of the man's socks. But this didn't reveal a whole lot because barley grass was in season at that time of year and just growing like an absolute weed throughout all of Australia. But he did discover something else in the trousers and this was a huge turning point in the case. Some sources say he found this in the fob pocket of the Summerton man's trousers, which is a pocket designed to carry a pocket watch. And other sources say that this was a secret pocket sewn into the inner waistband of the trousers. But in whichever case, whatever the pocket was, he ended up finding a tightly rolled little piece of paper. And when he unrolled it, he saw a printed elaborate font that read the words Taman Shud. At the time, these words meant nothing to him. They didn't mean anything to anyone. It wasn't until this detail hit the newspapers that they realized the gravity of these words. A police reporter from the advertiser came forward and advised them that The words were Persian and they meant essentially finished or the end. So this little piece of paper obviously added a certain tone to the Summerton man's death. And from this point on, Cleland and quite a few others became convinced that he had committed suicide. They just weren't sure how. The reporter also advised them that the piece of paper had likely been torn from a copy of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. Now, a Rubaiyat is a collection of Rubai, which are Persian poems made up by four lines. And the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam was a collection of 11th century Persian poems, first translated to English in 1859 by Edward Fitzgerald. The book had originally been a bit of a flop until 20 odd years later in the 1880s, 
movies when suddenly it was very popular throughout all of the English speaking world. Like there were Omar Khayyam clubs and allegedly even a cult formed that was inspired by the book. There is some question over whether Omar Khayyam actually wrote these poems because he wasn't a poet, he was an astronomer and a mathematician, but regardless, the poems were attributed to him and were all about things like life, death, love, and religion. Moving on, the Somerton Man was buried in the West Terrace Cemetery in Adelaide on the 14th of June, 1949. As no one had claimed the body, the Salvation Army pitched in for a plot and a headstone that read, here lies the unknown man who was found at Somerton Beach, 1st of December, 1948. I'd just like to say in a side note here, there are two other bodies in that grave that the Somerton man was buried on top of because it turns out that some cemeteries after the lease runs out on your grave will straight up bury other people on top of you and change your headstone. At least it was the case back then. I don't know if it is the case now, but it creeped me out. Oh, another lily break. Yeah, that's the mic. Three days after the Somerton man was buried on the 17th of June, a coronial inquiry was launched into his death. And honestly, it didn't achieve a whole lot. The couples that had seen him on the beach that night on the 30th talked about what they had seen. Dr. Dwyer talked about how surprised he was at the lack of poison in the man's system. But Sir Cedric Stanton Hicks came in. He was a professor in physiology and pharmacology, and he said that it was still possible that the Somerton man was poisoned, either by himself or someone else. It was just that the poison was a type that would decompose very shortly after death and be virtually undetectable. There were two such poisons that Hicks could think of, but these poisons were so deadly and so dangerous that he refused to say them aloud in court because they were actually quite readily available to the general public in pharmacies. He instead wrote the poisons down on a piece of paper and handed it to the coroner. And the poisons he had written down were digitalis, and the other poison he more strongly suspected was strophanthin, which is a glycoside derived from seeds of a plant native to Africa. The problem was that these poisons, just like any other poison, would have likely induced vomiting and convulsions. And like we've already discussed, there was no evidence of either of these on the scene. So Hicks' suggestion was that the man had been moved there either after he died or after the poison had started to take effect, and that the man the couple had seen there that night was not the Somerton man, but a totally different man altogether. But it seemed like such a huge coincidence that the man that these couples had seen laying in the exact same spot, in the exact same position, in the exact same clothes, was a different man to the one found there dead the next morning. I mean, the couples admitted they hadn't seen the man's face, but going off his clothes and the position he was lying in, they were all 100% convinced it was him. So producing no real answers, the coronial inquiry ended inconclusively on the 21st of June, 1949, with an adjournment sine die, meaning there was no date set to readdress the case again. Just one month later, though, there was another break in the case. South Australian police had been busy looking into the Taman Shud paper found on the Somerton Man, but they hadn't had much luck. It turned out the Rubaiyat had had a little bounce in popularity in Australia during the war, and there were quite a few editions available. On top of that, the book had been revised by the author four times, so there were five different versions of the text out there. So they had, of course, inquired at bookstores, libraries, publishers, but even though they knew the book that the text had come from, they had no idea what edition of that book they were looking for. But on the 22nd of July, a Glenelg businessman walked into a police station and handed in a copy of the Rubaiyat. Police flicked quickly to the end of the book and sure enough, the page where the phrase Taman should should have been had been torn and the phrase was missing. Thorough testing of the font and the paper revealed that it was a match. It was actually this exact copy of the book that the piece of paper in the Somerton man's pocket had come from. The only thing was the book didn't actually belong to the businessman. 
The businessman told the investigators that six months ago, just after the discovery of the Somerton man's body, he had discovered the book in the rear footwell of his car, a car that he kept parked just a few hundred yards from the beach. And as was common for the time, the windows were down and he imagined that some unknown person, for whatever reason, had chucked the book into the car. At the time, he hadn't thought much of it and the book had just sat in his glove compartment for the last six months. It wasn't until he read the newspaper and read about the investigation that he realized its potential significance. So he grabbed the book, saw the last page was torn and promptly handed it into police. But here is where things get even more interesting. In the back cover of the book, police discovered five lines of letters written in pencil that seemed to make up some kind of code or an encrypted message. Along with these letters were a couple of phone numbers. One of the numbers was for a local bank and the other number was an unlisted one, which led police to the front doorstep of a 27-year-old nurse, a nurse that lived just a five-minute walk from where the Somerton man's body had been discovered. This woman's identity was kept secret from the public for many years. So for now, we're just going to refer to her by the nickname she was known by in the newspapers, which was Justin. Justin was quite reluctant to speak to the detectives, but when they asked her about the Rubaiyat that her phone number had been found in, she admitted that she had owned a copy, but she had given it away to a man she had known during the war four years earlier. As you can imagine, the police were pretty damn pumped. This was a real lead. Their man could have been the man that Justin had given her copy of the Rubaiyat to. So they asked her to come in and view the plaster cast of the Somerton man. Justin, despite obviously wanting nothing to do with this investigation, hesitantly agreed. And her reaction to seeing the plaster cast was very dramatic to say the least. She took one look at it and then averted her eyes to the ground and refused to look back at it the entire time she was there. Detective Sergeant Lionel Lean, who was one of the lead investigators in the case, actually moved to stand behind her because she appeared to be swaying a little and he thought she might faint because she was so shocked. But despite everyone else in the room being completely convinced that Justin recognized the Somerton man, Justin swore she had never laid eyes on him in her life. When she was asked if this was the man that she had given her copy of the Rubaiyat to, she could neither confirm or deny it. She did mention that an unknown man had attempted to visit her in late 1948 when she wasn't home and that this man had asked her neighbor about her. She was asked a series of other questions, all of which she answered with either no or I don't know, still looking at the ground, still refusing to look back at the plaster cast, obviously just wanting out of there ASAP. So now police were completely thrown. What would make this woman so determined to hide the fact that she quite clearly knew this man? Justin's identity was hidden because before she left, she asked for her name to be erased from the file and not to be given to any third parties. That was how badly she wanted nothing to do with this case. So seeing as it was a missing persons case and not a murder investigation, police complied with her wishes and went on to pursue their new lead, tracking down this man that Justin had given her copy of the Rubaiyat to during the war. And I think that is where we are going to leave off for part one, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I would love to hear all of your thoughts and your theories so far in the comments down below. Because I am disorganized, I can't tell you exactly when part two is going to be out, just that it will be soon, but you should probably hit subscribe and the bell so that you don't miss it. In part two, we are going to talk about where this new lead took police, a little bit more about Justin, the code in the book, also the whirlwind romance that I mentioned at the start of the video, and the current day updates that are happening right now, which are very exciting. Lily, would you like to come say bye? Would you like to say bye? Oh. I saw you sitting in this chair earlier. Yeah. <laughs> Are you trying to take over? I think someone might be hungry. <laughs> My God. Thank you so much for watching this video and hanging out with me and Lily. We appreciate it so much and we can't wait to see you in the next one. Bye.